That's why the last session is on legacy. Very few people here would have known who Truett Cathy is. Very few. But I think when the name was mentioned, you know, you know Spurgeon, yes, we know Spurgeon. John Calvin, yeah, we know. But who is Truett Cathy? And of course, you would have been quite shocked to realize that there's been one of us who was born as poor as most of us have been born, perhaps even poorer, but who has arguably left the, the number one restaurant in the whole of the, what we would consider the greatest nation on the, on, on the planet at the moment. And yet his interest was not in money. It, it, yes, he was a businessman. There's no doubt about it. But he brought in uh, the concept that is biblical. Now, one thing nobody can ever miss from uh, Truett was he was a very generous man, a very generous man. He, uh, even within uh, Atlanta itself, he specifically supported one college team in American football. He sponsored it completely. Partly, it was because of his love for young people. And it will come through as, as we continue. And even with the Ford company that he was serving, he wasn't just selling, or rather, you know, giving them to test the food so that they could come to his restaurant. He also provided a lot of that same food to factory workers, a lot of times. So that, for instance, uh, in the year 2006, which was now 60 years of serving Ford assembly plant workers, 60 years of serving them that way, when they were closing off that plant, the last vehicle that they produced there, which is a Taurus, the very last one, they gave it to him as a gift. The company gave it to him as a gift for serving them faithfully for 60 years. Remember, it was for their workers that he created this sandwich. Remember that? As he was seeing them going in, carrying lunch boxes. So they knew he loved them, and therefore they loved him back. And also, as I've already stated, knowing that 70% of my employees are young people who, who are concerned about their future, he comes up with a, a scholarship system where he offers $1,000 scholarship per year to employees. Obviously, they had to go through uh, various systems. But here is what ended up happening. This scholarship fund lasted roughly, or well, at least the time that it was being, I was read, reading about it, it had been going on for 35 years. And in those 35 years, they had given out $23 million worth of scholarship. And that's money that you could have easily pocketed. It works out to roughly $650,000 a year. Now, obviously, it was growing, so the earlier years would have been smaller and the later years would be bigger. But still, think about it. Giving out scholarships to 650 of your employees a year so that they can better themselves as young people. So in the year 2008, Truett was awarded with the William E. Simon Prize for philanthropic leadership. In other words, a leader in business 
who is very generous. In 2008, it was given to him. His church pastor, Reverend Charles Carter, for the First Baptist Church in Jonesboro, wrote as follows. No one, rather he spoke to a, a reporter and he said, no one will ever know how many young people Truett has helped along the way. He helps them with family problems, medical bills, clothing costs, and college expenses. He says, many people will never know this. That's the generosity of that man. Now, we will remember that uh, two things that he emphasized a lot in his business model. One was the personal satisfaction of the customers. But number two, something I didn't emphasize as much, which now comes in, is a sense of obligation to the community and its young people. Remember what I said, the way he chose operators. He chose them from individuals who were interested in the community already. Not somebody just wanting out to make money, ah, but somebody who's already shown, has been showing that he is interested in that community, has been investing in that community already. And partly, this now gave birth to a more organized form of philanthropy or generosity, a more organized form. So in 1984, he founded what was called the Win Shape Foundation. Win Shape Foundation. That's literally Win Shape. And he, he just turned them around. Basically, shape winners. Shape winners. So what he wanted to do was to invest in young people so that he developed their potential and made them real winners in the world, real winners. So that's how he formed it. And uh, uh, through the Windship, Windship Foundation, he offered scholarships, which would go maybe 20000 maybe $25,000, to a college called Berry College in that same town. So it was very deliberate. He chose these promising young people and gave them scholarships so that they could go and study at this college. And also sponsored other youth-related programs. And it was out of the Windship Foundation that they also developed the Windship Homes. And the Windship homes were basically orphanages. And he had about 12 of them in three states, Georgia, Tennessee, and Alabama, where he was now putting Christian parents to look after a number of these young people. And he would have roughly 130 young people at any one time in these homes. And he personally visited them. And that's where that picture that, I uh, can't remember whether I was seeing it there or there, where he's, he's shown with a number of them uh, with him. Yeah, that's one of the pictures there. So those, that would have been one of the homes and then he's with the kids by the pond and so forth. All because he wanted to give them an opportunity in life. And he wanted them to be in a Christian environment. So the individuals, the couples that were running these homes, together with all the employees and so on, he would ensure that they are Christians, committed Christians to the local church. Not just professing to be Christians, but committed as well. Out of this same wind shape program, rather foundation, he also developed wind shape camps. And in these camps, 
um, he basically would get young people from the community, bus them in for a week of uh, ministry by uh, church pastors and preachers and, and older uh, believers and so on. And in 2010 alone, which was four years before he died, 10,000 people were present in these camps. 10,000 in one year. He sponsored them through this foundation. And then he also helped his son and daughter to start Windship retreat centers where couples and families could just go away from their busy lives and spend time together in a Christian environment. And those who needed counseling and so on would also be there and there would be Christian counselors helping them to make their way through their difficulties. All this was part of his Christian life that's being expressed out there in the world. Part of his legacy was not just the, the philanthropy or what did we call it, the generosity, but it's also the outcome that took place from his own children. Dan, the... Um, the eldest finally took over the business and therefore he became the president and chief executive of uh, Chick-fil-A up to now. Up to now. He, he runs the entire enterprise. The second born son um, has remained the senior vice president of Chick-fil-A, but he also now runs the Dwarf restaurants. You remember those. He actually built a number of others since then. Um, and so he's the one who runs that. And he's also the vice president of the, uh, the Windship Foundation. So he, na he runs the money bag for the entire family. And then uh, Truett's daughter, who's now married, she's Mrs. White. So Trude, Trudy Kathy White is the director of Windship Girls Camps. So remember the camps we talked about? So the ones for girls, it is his daughter who runs them. So even there you can see he, his children bought into the vision and they still run those enterprises. Uh, I've mentioned the fact that we, we are in private discussions, so I hope whoever's watching this doesn't put it anywhere on social media. But we're in private discussions with, with uh, Chick-fil-A, and it's the son who uh, is part of all this with respect to uh, sponsorship for the African Christian University. Again, why? Exactly, the same generosity that is there to uh, support the education of uh, young people. Um, very quickly, through it, as you've probably already noticed, w w was not a man to get into controversies. He just, you know, if you're a business owner, the last thing you want to do is to enter into the political fray because it inevitably impacts your, your, your business. So he, he generally kept away from the issues that were there in America. He con concentrated on his business. But behind the scenes, his foundation poured millions of dollars into the anti-homosexual movement, millions of dollars. It was because he genuinely believed in the family. He genuinely believed in the biblical teaching of human sexuality. So he poured a fortune there. 
Sadly, in 2012, two years before he died, and you know, he's now just entering into his 90s, so he's a fairly old man, uh, a, a journalist interviewed him. And in interviewing him, got his views on homosexuals and so on. And, and even those views were, were quite tempered, quite tempered. So he didn't say anything outrageous. But you know homosexuals. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 they basically hunt you down. So when the, the interview came out in a Baptist newspaper, they began to investigate. And it was those investigations that then brought out the fact that there was a connection between his foundation and quite a number of these anti-gay organizations in America. And when they were putting the figures together, it was going to millions of dollars. So there was the backlash when that was uh, revealed. And um, when they asked him, he's, he insisted that he's a Christian. What do you expect? I'm a Christian. I believe in what the Bible says about marriage, about male and female, and so on, including about homosexuality. So the, the gay community kicked up quite a fuss, painted him like a devil. You know the usual things they do on media, showing him as a very sort of sad individual who's against the joy of people and so on. And they called for a boycott for his restaurants so that the restaurants could close down. Because obviously, if you're not having customers, then you close down. The Christian community came to his side. They also campaigned heavily. For over that same period, when the, his restaurants were boycotted, they also campaigned saying, Christians, go and buy from his restaurant. And what happened was that they were the longest queues ever seen outside any restaurant. He made more money during that period than any other. In the end, of course, like all noise that is being thrown on, on an innocent person, uh, the whole thing just died out. And he generally was never involved in public debate and, and uh, um, arguments over the homosexual agenda or any other because he was primarily a business man. A few quick things as we go on. Um, Truett wrote a few books. One of them is his autobiography, which, by the way, I have, and I suspect somebody borrowed it. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's basically entitled Eat More Chicken. Inspire More People. That's the title. Eat More Chicken. That wrong spelling, by the way, the one we saw here. Okay and then inspire more people. He also wrote another book, which is a motivational book entitled, It's Easier to Succeed Than to Fail. It's easier to succeed than to fail. He wrote a parenting book, and the book is entitled, It's Better to Build Boys Than Mend Men. It's better to build boys than mend men. And then his fourth book is this one here. It explains his business success. How did you do it through it? That is his fourth book. His fifth book is on the significance of money in today's society, the significance or the importance of money in today's society. 
and is entitled, Wealth, Is It Worth It? Wealth, Is It Worth It? So those are the five books that he has written. He has co-authored a book with Ken Blanchard, and when I tell you its title, you can see that it's his, it's his heart again. It's entitled, Generosity Factor. Discover the joy of giving your time, talent, and treasure. That's the subheading. The generosity factor. Discover the joy of giving your time, talent, and treasure. Well, let's go on. In 2013, November, Truett finally retired as chairman and chief executive of Chick-fil-A. As I said, his firstborn son, Dan, took over both roles. That year, Chick-fil-A earned $5 billion. Please remember where it's coming from, eh? that picture. It earned $5 billion. His own fortune was estimated, his own fortune was estimated at $6.3 billion. Truett died on September the 8th, 2014, aged 93. He died of diabetes. He died at home peacefully surrounded by his own loved ones. Two days later, in the First Baptist Church of Jonesboro, remember we quoted the pastor uh, a few earlier on about his generosity, his funeral was held, and it was a small gathering that was limited only to close family members. His wife, Jeanette, died the following year, aged 92. And you can understand, they'd been married for about 65 years. It's, yeah, living without your spouse after that. And then, you know, she was quite old as well. It was just downward, and she was taken as well. Let's quickly talk about his honors, and with that, I will uh, close. First of all, in 1997, he was given an honorary degree in Doctor of Humane Letters from Oglethorpe University. Three years later, in uh, the year 2000, Ernest and Young awarded him Entrepreneur of the Year Lifetime Achievement Award. And most of you at least will know Ernest and Young uh, because that name continues up to today. So they honored him with the Entrepreneur Award of the Year, the Lifetime Achievement. In 2003, he was inducted into the Junior Achievement U.S. Business Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. We are continuing. We've entered into the 2000s. In the year 2007, Forbes magazine, which some of you will know, it's one that sort of deals with the uh, fortunes, ranked him as 380th richest man in America and 799th richest man in the world. There's a picture of him with George Bush there, if you got it. Yeah. 
In 2008, President George Bush bestowed on him the President's Call to Service Award. The President's Call to Service Award. And it shouldn't be surprising that he's now mingling with presidents, if you understand what he's been able to do. In 2009, he was awarded um, its OAK, O A K, and this must be initials for something, their highest award, the Laurel Crowned Circle Award, was given to him in 2009. Let me quickly mention a few other awards here. The Norman Vincent and Ruth Stafford Peel Humanitarian Award, the Horatio Alga Award, the William E. Simon Prize, okay, that one we, we already saw it, for philanthropic leadership, and then also the Boy Scouts of America Silver Buffalo Award was also given to him. So he's obviously now raking in these awards. He was inducted in, on April the 3rd, 2011, so we are now in the last phase of his life. He was inducted into the Indiana Wesleyan University Society of World Changers world changers that was in 2011 and not only was he inducted into that society of world changers but he was also given another doctorate an honorary doctorate of doctor of business doctor of business the following year may 2012 he was awarded an honorary doctorate at Liberty University. Liberty University is a Christian uh, university in the USA, probably one of the most well-known, together with presidential candidate um, Mitt Romney. Um, he was given an honorary doctorate on, uh, during their spring commencement ceremony. And it is said at that time, Mitt Romney was still attempting to, to be president, so he was in, in campaigns. And uh, it is said that when he went to get his award and was now speaking at that event, he turned to Truett Cathy and said to him that when our campaign team is going around the country, whenever we see a Chick-fil-A, we even say, let's break up for now. <laughs> and uh, we, we enjoy our lunch breaks there. In 2013, so this was now the year before he died, the state of Georgia made him one of their trustees. One of their trustees. The honor is given to individuals whose accomplishments and community service reflect the ideals of the original trustees of the colony of Georgia. When it was being founded between 1732 and 1752, so they inducted him in as a trustee. At the time of his death, Chick-fil-A was in over 40 states and there were more than 1,800 restaurants that were functioning. As I said, by now, there are almost 3,000, so almost double in the last seven years. He was very highly respected even among Christians and more so among Baptists and more so 
among Southern Baptists. And hence the picture that we, we had there where he's uh, with uh, Billy Graham in Billy Graham's own old age. Um, I want to end with just a few closing remarks and then we can have the, the final Q&A if, if it's going to be there. Um, first of all, a few sayings of his that capture something of his heart. They are at the end of this book. There are 11 of them. He calls them seven do's and don'ts of proven success. Number one, don't be burdened with personal debts in Congolese. Don't be burdened with personal debts. So he suggests just four. The first is a car payment. Now that's because our friends in the US, they, they buy brand new cars. Eh? They're not like us where you, know, you buy fifth hand to survive. So have one. Number two, a house payment. Again, unlike us who build our houses from scratch, our friends get a mortgage and then they buy a house and then they pay it over, over 20, 30 years. Number three, establish a nest egg. And basically all he's saying is uh, establish a home, okay? So marry every wife, raise your kids. And then lastly, live simple. Live simple. So that's the number one. The second is, with respect to business, start early as a teenager. Concentrate on what brings you happiness in your career. Have a tremendous want to determination. In other words, I want to be this in life, as a teenager. Have a passion, something you want to live for. And then as you go into your 20s upwards, you are now living that out. Rather than, you know, yeah. I can do what you want me to do, anything. <laughs> Number three, sacrifice material things and then reward yourself later. As you're setting out in life, sacrifice material things. You will reward yourself in due season. Number four, shortcut to success is this. Observe what is working in the lives of others. And then he said, teenagers, observe mature individuals. Mature adults, observe them. In other words, have role models. And here I would say, especially young people, Christians. Because you know these guys, they put faces for you on glossy magazine covers, eh? as though they are really making it in life. When actual fact, they are really your fellow young people. But Look at those who've gone ahead of you in years, who are stable, who are making it. Make them your real role models. That's number four. Number five, don't try to please everybody. I think that one is obvious. Eh? Don't try and please everybody. Number six, set priorities in proper order. And I think we know them, we're Christians. But the point he's saying is make it real. God first. Your family, number two. And then on one hand you've got church, and then on the other you've got your career. Or business, whatever it is. The point is, set your priorities right and do it. We, we were at, uh, I spent the last 
few days in Kitwe at a marriage seminar. And on the last day, we, we were dealing with, uh, we are developing a book, by the way, The Nyerendas. I think it was being advertised here for a number of you to go there. The Afro Nyerenda and Tina Nyerenda, the wife, they, they counseled quite a number of us, including my wife and I, when we were getting married. And uh, they've counseled over 100 couples. Basically, the same material has been developed, developed. Now, we want it to be turned into a book. So we had roughly 80 individuals that spent two days, um, halfway through Wednesday, all the way to yesterday at lunch. And we were basically going through this material, talking about improving it and so on. So the very last session was in terms of updating it to today. And uh, so we had trending issues like uh, um, uh, social media, which was hardly being covered uh, in those days because it just wasn't there. But one of the things that was also uh, highlighted, because we had a few young people that were bringing in issues, uh, is the way in which, for career purposes, couples are willing to live apart. Uh, and it's like each job is uh, equally important. So you have a wife in Livingstone and the husband is in Kasama. And n none of them are even thinking in terms of giving up any of the jobs and they're basically saying, you know, okay, you know, one of these days, God willing, we might end up in the same town, one of these days. And uh, they were talking in terms of how it has multiplied unfaithfulness in marriages and marriage breakdown. Okay. Uh, and ultimately, it's a problem of priorities. It's the fact that marriage has been brought lower than career. It's been brought lower. And our relatives, unfortunately, can be very bad voices. Because they say to you, no, you, you train for this job. You, you can't resign. You know, you wait until there's another opening there. In the meantime, you know, you need your job. After all, you are even going higher and higher. You are now, you know, district manager or whatever else it might be. Uh, the point is saying here is get your priorities right. God, marriage, and family. And then out of that come your two spheres, the spiritual and the material, church and work. Uh, number seven, which we've already seen, expand cautiously. Grow your business cautiously. I think we've seen that already. I won't spend time on it. Number eight, franchising may or may not be good for your particular business. Use it cautiously. Okay, so he's found a formula for it, and I think we, we saw that and inevitably, therefore, was able to bring in good standing Christians. He got them from that same society. They were already living out their Christian lives. The testimonies in the church were coming through. The testimonies in the community were coming through. This is a real Christian and is interested in making this his sole business. So, be cautious. Number nine, be prepared for disappointments. Many successful individuals experience failure. I think that's said a lot in motivational circles these days, so we'll skip that. Be, be kind to people. I think we've picked this up already. Courtesy is very cheap, but brings great rewards. Courtesy is very cheap, but brings great rewards. Reward, dividends, rather. But here's his last one, and you can't miss him, and his godliness. Invite God to be involved in every decision. God gives you a brain to use, common sense. You can do it if you want to. God has given each of us a talent. Maybe yours is yet to be discovered. We honor God with our success. He designed us to be winners. 
So bring God into your every decision. And he's not talking about whether you should be a missionary or a pastor or whatever. It's in the realm of business here. He's saying never make a decision without God and his word, obviously, being in the picture. Okay? Two more. Oh, no, no, I've got a few more here, and uh, with that I will end. The difference between success and failure is often about 5% more effort. The difference between success and failure. Just 5% more effort. And then it says here about commitment. We start seeing miracles take place when we truly commit ourselves. When we truly commit ourselves. And, and it's true, brethren, about church work. I was saying to somebody just yesterday that a lot of times in Christian circles, and I'm speaking about saving the Lord, we don't do things because we want, we say we don't have the money. So our thinking is, when we have the money, then we will do this kind of ministry. And I was saying to him, that in my life as a Christian pastor, I have found that it's, it's the reverse. That it's when we begin doing something, with the little we have, that somehow the Lord's money comes into the picture. It's, it's incredible. Literally everything. Our missions work has been exactly the same. We've always started a mission station before we have money, and then money comes in. Internship is exactly the same thing. We've always begun with interns and more numbers, and then the money has started coming in. Our literature ministry, exactly the same thing. We, we started, we were just photocopying, 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 and then we were selling those little photocopied books. As I'm speaking right now, there's so much money that we, 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 we're now saying, come on, let's, let's, let's get more and more books out, more and more books out, and so on. You, it's where your burden is, your heart is, where the Lord leads you. Start and see the miracle that the Lord will do. But four minutes already gone, two more. He says this. This is uh, still true at talking. If you wish to enrich days, plant flowers. If you wish to enrich years, plant trees. If you wish to enrich eternity, plant ideals in the lives of others. Plant ideals in the lives of others, you will enrich eternity. And here's the last. Truett Cathy, how would you like to be remembered? Your legacy, what is it you'd like to be remembered for? Here's his answer. I'd like to be remembered as one who kept my priorities in the right order. We live in a changing world, but we need to be reminded that the important things don't change. And the important things will not change if we keep our priorities in proper order. And that's the reason why even after being such a wealthy man with so much business all over America, on Sunday, he was in church. And he was teaching his class 50 years until he was too old to do so. Amen. After that sharing, uh, it's only in order to say, wow, wow. Because many a times we hear of Christians who are business men and women, but not a self-made billionaire who truly, truly loves the Lord. And the Lord did fight his battles. Uh, Pastor, when you mentioned about the backlash, 
in 2012 uh, over the comments that he had made and uh, all these uh, you know, protests. And that happened to have been the year that Christians also rallied behind Chick-fil-A. Uh, in 2013, you mentioned uh, their sales growth or grew by five billion. They actually surpassed KFC. <laughs> that year they surpassed KFC despite the backlash. So, you know, you can see that uh, when you do not forsake God, God will not forsake you. Uh, I think one of uh, the legacies that uh, Truett also has to his name is that uh, whilst he was alive, he faced so many economic opportunities to sell his company, to list his company, and he totally refused. I mean, we were told that he's worth about six billion at the time of his death. He could have been worth much more than that, but he refused. And the reason he refused, for spiritual reasons. He knew that once he leased the company, then they will start opening on Sunday, then they will not give to those charities, to anti-gay uh, organizations and stuff like that. It was for that reason. So he was not looking at the profits, he was not looking at the numbers, he was looking at glorifying God. And that purpose, that corporate purpose to glorify God by being a faithful steward comes alive in the decisions that he was making. Wow. We all like a story of rags to riches, not least because it inspires us. But what can be better than rags to riches that is undergirded by Christian values, that is really something to marvel and to try and imitate. Well, uh, we've got about uh, 25 minutes, or rather 35 minutes. Uh, we are going to enter into a Q&A. Uh, this time we'll revert back to the original Q&A where you ask questions to pastor uh, as opposed to me asking you what you got from uh, uh, the legacy of this uh, uh, great man. Uh, in incidentally, uh, you know, his vision was really infused into his children. You know, his son who's running uh, Chick-fil-A, he's equally um, very strong on family, uh, focus on family. And he himself has also gotten into trouble over his views about uh, same-sex marriages. So it's a vision that has been planted and it's being carried on. Uh, before we get into the Q&A, uh, just uh, an announcement. Uh, the table in the corner, it's still there. But good news for the common man. Uh, what was going for, is it 13 kwacha a cup, has now dropped to 10 kwacha. So there are discounts that you can enjoy if you make your way there now. And uh, you will be helping a, a budding entrepreneurs by uh, buying from them. So let us enter into uh, Q&A. Uh, what is it that has inspired you about the legacy? What is it that you are not clear about? What is it that you can emulate? Or what is it that you would like Pastor to expand on regarding, uh, regarding uh, Truett's legacy? Yes, at the back there. At the back. Uh, thank you very much, Pastor, for that sharing. It was inspiring. 
But then uh, what I would have loved to come out is the challenges in more detail, um, if there is any um, that you can illustrate on with regards to the business and um, sort of not going against. I know he's highlighted a few, but is there any other incidents with regards to maybe even workers that would have affected his business or the way um, uh, he viewed life from the biblical perspective? Okay. Yeah, so the question is, uh, are you able to, I mean, he should have loved to hear more of the kind of uh, difficulties that he may have experienced. Yeah, uh, I think first of all, any businessman will tell you that they will open some shops and close them. Okay, so that happened um, a number of times. Um, because it's, it's part of business. Disappointments with some of the, especially operate, uh, sort of operators, what you would call franchise uh, individuals, uh, that inevitably uh, also uh, took place. So it's, it's the regular things that happen with, with, uh, with business. The, uh, the let me give a typical example, which again was going to be too much detail and therefore I didn't add it to it. Um, when they first went into the malls, they were the first ones. Inevitably, others begin to say, hey, you know, they, there's money here. And they also started coming into the malls. So they, they, they then began to have actual local competition within the malls themselves. But what happened is that the malls decided that we are now going to have food courts. In other words, instead of KFC being on one end of the mall and uh, McDonald's in the middle and then Chick-fil-A on the opposite end, they basically designed the malls in such a way that all the eating places were in one place and then there would be, well, the, you, you, you would have the shops next to each other, and then the eating place is one. Um, that brought inevitable competition literally to your doorstep. <laughs> okay. it literally to your doorstep. Um, and it becomes, it, it adds trial to yourself. Um, you, you can imagine if, if you are running your own car restaurant and then next door is Hungry Lion. You know what's going to happen. If, if, next door, there is a queue, they're even going out. You, there's no boot. Okay. Even that is sending signals to other people that the better food is next door. Okay. So that was one inevitable difficulty. The second difficulty was he, he, he was a stickler for, for, for cleanliness. So now, the, the eating places were dirty. That in itself was a minus for him. Um, he says that later on, as they complained and complained and complained, the, the mall owners improved on the hygiene, which uh, was, was great for them. But it, it took time for, for that to happen. And then again, he was, cleanliness for him was not just in the eating place, but also the toilets. It was a major thing for, uh, for him. And so going into the toilets for those food courts, in a, so that's one of the things that motivated them to start stand-alone restaurants, because it was like we've been shortchanged. And so they, they went into that. But it was a costly venture because now he said it costed them double the amount of money for opening every shop. Whereas previously, it was just modifying the inside. Now, when I say just, it's a lot of money for our friends because you bring in equipment and everything else and so forth. But now they also had to do the physical structure. They had to come up with the maintenance teams. So they now had 
the estate department of uh, Chick-fil-A, which previously he would not have even thought about. So yes, there were a number of challenges uh, along the way, but it's the kind of challenges that are common, really, to any business owner. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, by the way, uh, this is a general Q&A. So if you have questions from the uh, first session, second session, and even the session that we've just had, you are free to ask. If there are certain questions or certain areas that you thought pastor should have covered, he probably had the information, but like he said, for the sake of detail, he didn't. So this is a, an opportunity you can ask uh, any question from the three presentations? There's a hand here. Two and hands. Hello. Microphones. Oh, there's a third hand here, but he's the one who chooses who asks first. All right. Uh, thank you so very much for laboring through Mr. Truett's uh, life history, his legacy and honors. My question stems from the gospel exposure. And in relation to the purpose uh, statement of Chick-fil-A, do we have any record or written testimonies from non-Christians in that maybe directly or incidentally they got exposed to the gospel? Is there any form of record or testimony that has been recorded that we can perhaps have uh, privy to? Yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, just two quick things. Number one is that um, uh, Truett did not say that his restaurants should be preaching the gospel. He didn't say that. He didn't even attempt to do that. But definitely he wanted his restaurants to leave the gospel to live out the, uh, the biblical principles. And that's why when he was called by uh, uh, Congress to go and speak, he said to them, look, this concept you have of business ethics, it's not real. It's the individual ethics that are there. And it's the gospel that changes people that enables them to be what, what they are. So uh, in my reading, therefore, there was nothing about you know, him, himself, or his restaurants sharing the gospel. Okay. The, but in terms of them uh, investing in Christian missions, yes, they, they actually have a, a department um, in Chick-fil-A that specifically finances missions. And as we are talking about SCU, it's actually in, under that that we are presently talking. And it's very clear in their minds, it's gospel work that they are uh, sponsoring. So in that sense, um, what testimonies will there be? Well, you know, the money that is funding, you know, the preachers and the preachers are doing things, rather than directly related uh, to Chick-fil-A itself. But thirdly and lastly, um, the southern states of America, which is where Atlanta, Georgia is, uh, it's, it's called the Bible Belt. That's where you have, and it's, it's almost crazy, I've never seen it anywhere else, where is a road like Chirimbulu would have 10 Baptist churches. <laughs> and it's not two Timba Baptist churches, uh -uh, you know, huge Baptist churches, 10 of them in the same street. So it's a place that is just filled with, uh, with churches. Uh, and so uh, it's not so much that he, he needed to add evangelism. You know, it's not so much that. It was more the, the living out Christianly that was now uh, an all-important element. Okay, thank you very much for that question. Good afternoon, Pastor. Yeah. Mr. Good afternoon. Uh, you mentioned that he bought a lot of land or hectares of land. I would want to know what he was doing on that land. Was he even doing some poultry farming to make sure that there was continuous supply of chicken meat? Yeah, I, I, I didn't pick any details 
as to what he was doing on that land. It was a family farm that he basically bought, and therefore he raised his, his kids there. Uh, it's, it's highly possible that, you know, he was actually uh, raising, uh, especially poultry, because his business was in poultry. But he could have as well also raised uh, cows, because in due season, obviously, he had uh, the dwarf restaurants, which were not just in chicken, but also uh, in beef. But, you know, at the level at which he was operating, is, there's no way, even if he had 2,000 acres of, <laughs> of land, there was no way he would supply all those uh, uh, restaurants with the level of food that was passing through. So a, a lo the, the supply chains were uh, a, a, a very specialized form of the business, which is, again, something that headquarters would be managing and monitoring so that there is, uh, the quality is being maintained from source, uh, where the chickens are being raised. The, the quantities are also assured because, trust me, when you are in that kind of business at the level, it's like our uh, shop right here. You remember the difficulties they had with, was it onions or something? Yeah. You know, going, eh, you should be buying onions from us and so on. Yeah, but are you able to supply this quantity and this grade? Nobody wants to talk about it at that point. So, yeah, he would have been doing something like that, but it, I, I don't think that's the real source of uh, the inputs into the business. Thank you. In the lecture, you did mention that he didn't go beyond high school. Yes. So uh, I would like to know if there's any information to that effect. Uh, what did he do to make up in terms of uh, uh, improving himself? Uh, is there anything to that effect? Uh, maybe he's okay. Maybe he's reading uh, culture. His uh, attitude towards uh, learning more, improving himself, and all of that. I would like to know more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all, I didn't read anything that went beyond in terms of his personal improvement in terms of education. Um, yes, I mean, he probably did some amount of reading to improve himself, but the main thing was that he was a Christian who was applying Christian principles to his world of business. And the basic idea was, let me, instead of think profit, let me think people. Let me love the community, invest back into the community, especially into the lives of young people. Uh, let me build relationships with the community uh, through this. Um, now, part of the reason why I'm saying I didn't read anything about that is because that in itself was fairly innovative. In other words, if he had been reading books from Harvard School of Business and so on, they probably would not have been saying that. <laughs> okay, they wouldn't have been saying, love your neighbors, you love yourself, you know, and so forth. So I think he was largely a self-made man in that sense. But when I say self-made man, it's, it's not devoid of uh, the Bible. Okay, it's, it's that he took his Christianity seriously. He, he thought through those things. He saw them lived out in his parents, and he passed them on to his children uh, so that his children were not living with a silver spoon in their mouth, you know. Our father is this grand person and so on. So even when they were joining, he made sure they were employees. So they were earning salary. And they, they were making their way to the top through hard work and so on. Uh, again, those are principles he himself got from his parents as uh, they, they involved them in the boarding houses, that especially the mother was running and so forth. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, he would have been doing some level of reading, obviously. But that was not the primary source of what made him what he is. So there's a hand there, another one there. Okay. So before we get to the uh, next round of uh, 
uh, questions. Just uh, an amplification on uh, one or two questions that were asked uh, about whether anybody came to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ through the institution of chicken filet. Like Pastor rightly said, it wasn't an evangelistic institution. That wasn't their mission. Their mission was to sell chicken, you know, and to do it in such a way that was God-honoring. Uh, so the way that uh, Truett lived out his life, you know, it actually spoke of the gospel. There are two uh, incidences that uh, I came across. One had to do with an employee uh, of uh, chick fil -A who had worked for, an for, for the organization for six years, and he was a Muslim. And uh, after he was fired, obviously for bad behavior, I mean, for him to have worked for six years, it wasn't because he wasn't a Christian, which was his argument. He says, I've been fired because I don't go for their devotion. I mean, six years you've been <laughs> working there and you haven't been fired. This one time, you get fired. Uh, now, just to show the man's uh, heart, he could have actually countersued him, you know, but he settled the matter outside the court and uh, the man went away with quite a hefty uh, package, despite the fact that he was wrong. So that speaks of uh, the man and what he believed in the gospel. Then a second incident was uh, involving some two young girls who trashed his house. Trashed meaning they had, you know, some kind of a party, you know, where they broke things and stuff like that. And he was quite justified to actually sue, you know, those two girls or their parents. But uh, instead he spoke to the parents of those two girls and they were grounded, I think six months, no watching TV and things like that. And, uh, you know, the, you know the, the, they were not brought before the court of justice. So if one can't get saved from observing a man who is Christ-like, then he's just stubborn. Mm -hmm. But certainly, he, he lived out his, uh, his life like Christ. Uh, then there was... The question that you asked about, did he improve himself? Uh, there is one book that uh, Samuel Cathy uh, mentions which inspired him. So mm. that tells us that he probably did read. Mm. And it's by Napoleon Hill called uh, Think Rich. Huh? What? Think Rich Grow? Sorry? Yeah, think, so you know it. Think and Grow Rich. So that book actually is one of the books that he read as a teenager and it, it inspired him. So there you are. Yeah. Good, so two questions. Um, I'll need to leave in exactly 15 minutes, so let's make sure we are done by them. There was uh, a question there, rather a hand there. Anyway, he's the one who's choosing. Thank you very much, Pastor, for what you have um, shared with us this, this day. I just have a question on how you would encourage parents. Um, listening to you, you've, we've seen the influence of um, um, Kathy's parents' mother on him, and um, he passed on his skills and business to his children as well. And I think it's one thing that we also see amongst our Asian friends. Sometimes we see that their children take over their businesses, they get involved. So what would you say to Christian parents? Should we make our children <laughs> <laughs> take over our business or get involved in our businesses or we let them free to do what they want to do? I mean, what, how can you inspire us? Yeah. Yeah. I think, first of all, there are two things. Uh, there's a saying that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I think you've heard that phrase. You know, all it means in the real world is that an apple falls down. You know, it doesn't sort of fall that far. And, and the point is, first of all, no, we should not 
put any pressure on our children to follow our ways. I think that's, whether it's in terms of the Christian faith or whatever, it's at, at the most, uh, what happens in our homes is that our children see us. They hear what we are saying. They, they easily see what our passion is. And uh, in that sense, we, we brush off them our values. And that ultimate lesser point. The, the, we brush off them our values. Now, yes, they, they may therefore want to come, assuming we are business people, they might want to come into our actual business, but they are coming in with their values, or they might go elsewhere, but it will be our values again that they, they uh, take away. So if I was to answer that question, I would say that yes, let's primarily pass our values to them. Uh, and also, in a sense, whether we like it or not, we do pass our values to them. But let's make sure we are passing on positive biblical values to them, which I want to repeat, they see, they hear, they know the way we are living. They, you know, if whatever is your passion comes through things you do, and therefore uh, they, they take it with, with them. Um, and then, of course, if we have avenues that uh, they can take up from us, uh, like an inheritance, then yes, you know, they can uh, come in as well and uh, run with our, uh, our enterprises. There was a time we brought a businessman here uh, by the name of Nico van der Merve. He runs a hearing aids business in South Africa. And uh, his eldest son now is the chief executive of that business. And their daughter is also very much involved in it. And so the father and mother, they still are part of it, but they are you know, slowly moving further away. We brought another businessman here, and it was John Temple. Uh, but his main line of business is not what his children have taken up. Um, they've, they've gone into business themselves and different uh, types. Uh, some of them in terms of starting businesses, others in terms of being employed in business and inducing and growing into partners. Um, but you can't still miss the values that is, is left uh, with, with them. In fact, one of them runs one of South Africa's biggest uh, uh, bookshops. He himself was not in bookshops, but his son is, and we, we get some of their books through our bookshop here. So uh, I think it's the values, ultimately, that we, we should make sure that we are passing on deliberately and ensuring that we are passing on positive uh, biblical values. Thank you. Um, yes. Good afternoon, Pastor. Yeah. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I really appreciated how you drew out lessons. I just wanted to find out if in the material that you had read, there was anything mentioned about him maintaining his devotion to God amidst all of the business involvements that he had. I'm particularly asking about that because many are the times when we as believers start out well and faithfully, then along the way, as we achieve more and more success, we begin to deviate from that which we held on to and prioritize the business. So any insight in that regard? Yeah, perhaps just two. One is that he remained a faithful church member. Faithful in, in the sense that not just Sort of showing up in church from time to time but having a specific area in church life that he saves him and as he said earlier he, he did not believe in half-hearted things he he committed himself so the church leaders knew that you know this class for these teenagers you don't even need to look there he was uh, that committed in terms of his own personal devotional life i didn't come across anything but what I came across was his uh, testimony of how his wife 
was a major pillar in his life and in the life of the children. Yeah, that uh, was testified to fairly strongly, both by him and also by some of the children. So definitely the wife helped to keep him anchored spiritually while his business was growing. So she was helping in the business. That also is mentioned quite categorically, uh, that she was a major supporter, but she was also ensuring that the family was well catered for spiritually and also, as we said, finance, financial commitment to the church. She was you know, pricking him in. We, this we mustn't overlook. We must give the Lord his time. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Uncle Mleo. Um, Pastor, I think by principle, um, you are encouraged to separate your business brand from yourself. So your business is existing here and you're existing uh, here. Uh, but as you begin to build a big brand, people obviously can't separate the two. They want to uh, put the two of them together. Um, is it enough for a businessman who finds himself in that situation to try as hard as they can uh, to refrain from perhaps making their uh, beliefs that may seem controversial to the world that could potentially ruin uh, their relationship with some, some of their customers, would it be enough for them to merely sort of give a blind eye and try as much as possible to refrain from making their stance uh, known and be neutral and simply say, I'm here and my business is over here? All right. Again, that's a very good example of uh, Truett because in terms of the public profile, he knew that I'm running a chain of restaurants and therefore I should not be distracting in the process by making so much noise on this side that uh, in the end um, I'm distracting from the business itself. But he was still the Christian through it. And therefore, behind the scenes, he was still supporting causes that he genuinely believed in. Uh, so his business was a Christian business in that sense. He, he ensured, and deliberately so, that my ethics come through my business. So that he, he, he put there. But beyond his ethics, like all of us, we've got opinions on things. That he, and he ensured that whatever they were, they were not contradicting and therefore taking away from, from the business. And even when the, the uh, homosexual issue came up, he didn't say, well, no, I have, I have no opinion. You know, I, I don't know, you know, these things. He didn't do that. He was clear that this is who I am. I'm a Christian. What else are you expecting? Okay. This is what I believe. And of course, they took that and uh, stretched it now to uh, mean his, uh, this is what he's really doing and so on all the time. And especially when they found that his monies were, were actually quietly going there. Um, but yeah, um, he, 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 it was not what he was doing the most on the outside. He knew. Uh, what he needed to do. So in, in that sense, I would want us to, to, to see in him a role model a, in terms of being as wise as serpents and yet as innocent as doves, uh, realizing that, yes, we do have personal beliefs and we can do something in terms of what we are supporting in society, even if we are not publicly being seen as a uh, a face for those. But with respect to our business, morality is morality. Ethics is ethics. You can't say, uh, you know, in, in the business, it's okay if I, I don't have biblical principles, but as a person, I've got biblical, you know, you can't do that. So in that sense, it, it should imbue everything that you do. 
Since it was the last question, let me just make one more comment and then I'll take my seat. In a sense, I'm speaking now representative of ourselves uh, as, uh, uh, as elders. We keep these seminars, brethren, uh, because you people here, you have the potential to impact Zambia and impact Africa. But you cannot be what you don't know. You can't. And that's why we are constantly putting before you role models, role models of pastors, role models of uh, people in the realm of music, poets, and so on, role models in politics, uh, role models in reformers like um, William Wilberforce, role models in terms of missionaries, uh, and so forth. We are, and even role models in terms of mothers, like the mother to the Wesley brothers. Uh, we went through an entire uh, seminar on her, Susanna Wesley. It's, it's very deliberate. It's so that you people, you know, if you are short, let's suppose you are short, and then you live among dwarfs, do you know that you'll be going like this? Hmm? Yes, you, you really feel you are tall. Because everybody around you is a dwarf. But then, you, you spend a, a bit of time with American basketball players. You start wondering, you should have been pulling yourself in bed, you know, quite a while so that you can also be tall. And that's the whole point. Generally speaking, we are surrounded by a spirituality of dwarfs. That's what we are surrounded by. People who don't take their Christianity seriously. So if we don't show you good role models, you'll be patting yourselves on the back when in actual fact on the judgment day be terribly embarrassed. So the time is now, and that's what we are doing, to, to, to learn about these role models and then to do this. To say, okay, what about me in the light of this? That's really the catch. What about me in the light of this? So what we've done this year is to put before you a business owner who started from scratch, that language, and shown you something of the principles and philosophies that have enabled him to end up where he is. And to challenge all of us, as our moderator said, to think entrepreneurship not as a dirty thing, but as something you can be in as a Christian entrepreneur, a Christian entrepreneur. That you're not just thinking in terms of, you know, my friend is, is selling buying tomatoes here and selling here is making some money. Let me also go and start buying tomatoes and selling here. But to be thinking in, in principles like this, what is it that our community, our society, just the people around me need? What is it? And some of the needs, they don't even know themselves. They're not conscious of it. But you see it. And you say, how can I turn that into a business venture. Simple. How can I turn that into a business venture? And bang, you turn it into a business venture, it multiplies, the monies are coming in inevitably. And yes, you do have one idea, but it's not the main thing. And once we begin seeing that, we will have a different Christian entrepreneurship compared to this thing that you see it on Facebook all the time. How to make money, how to make money, how to make money. You know, you can be rich tomorrow, you can have big money. And it's Christians who are saying that. We should be saying, what service should we be giving that we can then turn into a business? And we will impact our nation, we will impact the continent. Thank you very much. Finally, brethren, we have come 
to the end of our session uh, on uh, the early life, uh, the businessman, and the legacy of Samuel Truett Cathy. I pray, God, that you have picked up something that can inspire you to do something uh, for the Lord uh, with Truett. His mission was to serve the Lord through selling sandwiches, chicken sandwiches. I hope that uh, we can go out of here and uh, emulate uh, Truett. It remains my single honor to use uh, Truett's expression, say it has been my pleasure to host uh, past. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much to the audience for your participation. It was quite lively, and I'm sure if we had not put a cup, you would have still wanted to go on. So I want to thank you for your participation, and uh, may God bless you. I'll ask our elder Charles Botta to come and close for us. And remember the table in the corner, it's still there, and uh, maybe... I, I just haven't received communication. There could be further discounts. So you do, uh, I, don't, I don't mean to run you out of business, but you do uh, to just go there and find out uh, what they're selling. Thank you very much. After, uh, after Elder Bota has prayed, we are dismissed. Let's pray together. Dear God and uh, Father in heaven, we are thankful. This is a day that we've been praying for, a time we've been praying for. Asking, O oh Lord, that you would gather us together to again learn from another one of Chris, uh, the, the many Christian heroes that are out there that have lived a life worth emulating. Our Father, we are thankful for our pastor and the way that he has brought out the material. We pray, O oh God, for a lasting effect upon each one of our lives. The writer of the Hebrews tells us to emulate those who did well, especially the leaders who did well, and especially spiritually. And here was a man who did very well in an area where very few people do well, the area of running a business. So we pray, our oh God, that there might be lasting effect on many of us, picking up some of these principles, O oh Lord, that have been shown to us from the time we started until now that we've ended. Now bless, O oh God, these things to us and bless the rest of the day to us, tomorrow as we gather together and in the week that is to come, that it might be again seen afresh as a time of service in whatever area of calling with which you've called us. We pray and ask in Jesus' name all these things. Amen.